much. Thank you very much. Judge George Rokara, thank you very much for the warm introduction. Thank you all for the warm welcome to Chief Justice Gantz and the members of the Honorable Courts, state and federal, federal, to the members of the executive and legislative branches who are here, Senator Cowan is here, to members of the Governor's Council, the Judicial Nominating Commission, the Joint Bar Committee, and the Office of the Governor's Chief Legal Counsel, all of whom do so much to present wonderful opportunities for a governor to choose fabulous appointees. To the reverend clergy, my brothers and sisters at the bar, ladies and gentlemen, I first want to add my own personal welcome back to the members of the Hines family. This is it. <laughs> I mean, I just say, you, you were just here, okay? Um, there isn't anything else I can do. <laughs> but I do want to make clear, I would if I could. She's that good. Justice Hines has so many friends who uh, showed up, made their voices heard, during her uh, nomination and confirmation process, I was afraid we would so run out of time that we wouldn't have been able to be here on time. I haven't met a single person who didn't have a compliment, who didn't have an expression of respect and admiration, indeed inspiration, from this extraordinary person. This is a person of considerable clarity of intellect and tough-mindedness depth of character. And that is a blessing for our court and for the people our courts serve. But this is also a person of extraordinary kindness. And I want to tell you, I think kindness does not get its due. Kindness is what makes it possible not just to lift up and touch and encourage someone, as important as that is, but on a court, kindness is what enables the court to see the people behind the docket number, to imagine through the record what those life experiences are and how those problems present themselves what it is people are turning to the court for, the solution to their challenges, just a way forward, a sense of justice. And justice isn't some corny thing we roll out at occasions like this or on national holidays. It is the business of the courts. And yes, it is framed by the laws the legislature enacts and the Constitution we all respect. But its end is justice. Its purpose is justice. And without kindness, I submit justice cannot be fully done. I think we have a tough-minded, wicked smart, <laughs> exceptionally kind addition to the Supreme Judicial Court. I, Geraldine S. Hines. I, Geraldine S. Hines. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. To the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And will support the Constitution thereof. 
and will support the Constitution thereof. So help me God. So help me God. I, Geraldine S. Hines. I, Geraldine S. Hines. Do solemnly swear and affirm. Do solemnly swear and affirm. That I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge and perform. Discharge and perform. All the duties incumbent on me. All the duties incumbent upon me. As Associate Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court. As Associate Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court. According to the best of my abilities and understanding. According to the best of my abilities and understanding. Agreeably to the rules and regulations. Agreeably to the rules and regulations. Of the Constitution and the laws of this Commonwealth. Of the Constitution and the laws of this Commonwealth. So help me God. So help me God. I, Geraldine S. Hines. I, Geraldine S. Hines. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. I am so appreciative to my former colleagues, my one of my best friends on the court, Chris Muse. I can never call him up and tell him what I really want because he's always telling me what he wants me to know. But, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, Barbara Dorch O'Cara and I have been friends for over 40 years, friends and colleagues. And Rasan is my son by another father because I met him when he was 15 years old when David Hall brought him by to meet a lady lawyer. <laughs> Thank you all. And Judge Wright, uh, you brought the house down. That was <laughs> Now, I do embrace and celebrate this first, and I plan to savor this moment at least until September 2nd when the demands of being a justice of the Supreme Judicial Court will make the excitement and splendor of today sadly a distant memory. <laughs> but in truth, I long for the day when the honor bestowed upon me will not seem so extraordinary, but instead utterly ordinary. You have done your part, Governor Patrick, so we can only trust that the person who next sits in the seat where you have sat for almost eight years will not falter, but will pick up the torch you have lit and run with it. I am honored to be a part of this court, also because I will serve with three other justices who happen to be female an eventuality that you, Ruthie Abrams, the first female justice of the Supreme Judicial Court, could only dream of. Chief Justice Gantz, you may be the king of the court, but now girls rule. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I'm not. When I started this journey as a new lawyer in 1971, I had no idea where I was going or how I would get to wherever it was I was supposed to be. But all along the way, I have been inspired and encouraged by people who walked beside me, challenged me, and taught me a lot about what it means to be totally and irrevocably, irrevocably committed to the cause of justice. Some of those people are here today, and I want to say thank you. Community leaders like Mel and Joyce King, Lenny Durant, George Morrison, and Lloyd King, they're all old warriors now, so you may not know them. My former law partners, Winston Kendall, Judge Charles Johnson, Margaret Berner, and Judge Judith Nelson Dilde. I started this journey at a time when there were very few lawyers of color, so I owe a debt of gratitude to Chief Justice Roderick Ireland, 
attorneys Willie Davis, Wayne Budd, Glendora Putnam, Walter Prince, Wallace Sherwood, and others who have offered me wise counsel and support over the years, and who in their own way have modeled the commitment to excellence and to service to the community. And a special word to Justice Fred Brown. I hope he's here. A colleague and mentor of the First Order. Justice Brown, I am indebted for your example as a principal jurist and for your fearless devotion to justice. I thank Chief Justice Barbara Rouse and my former Superior Court colleagues and staff who are incredibly devoted to the very difficult job they do every day. Chief Justice Raposa and my appeals court family, judges, attorneys, and staff, all of whom welcome me with open arms and embrace my presence on the court with enthusiasm, respect, and genuine collegiality. I thank you all. And I thank my new colleagues, all of whom have offered their support, congratulations, and welcome. And to my Bethel AME Church family, my church lady friends who are all over there, who have been with me through thick and thin and prayed for and with me whenever the need arose. To my friends from near and far, especially my college roommate, Dr. Patricia Alexander, who is here from Mississippi. And I see many of you here, and I wish I could call every one of you by name. But just know that my heart leaps with joy at the thought that all of you have meant so much to me over the course of the very long journey to now. And of course, my family. I thank my family here in force at great personal sacrifice. My baby brother, my baby sister, my nieces, my nephew, my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law. I thank you all for the pride in my accomplishments. To my 92-year-old mother, who just couldn't bear another trip to Boston, who could not be here. I have profound gratitude for your prayers, Mom. I have soared on the strength of your prayers, not on the strength of my own gifts, whatever they are. To my family, I thank you for your pride in my accomplishments. To my wonderful and lovely daughter, Dr. Naoki Wright, thank you for being my best friend in the whole world and for dedicating your life to a noble and honorable calling. A final thank you to a dear and departed friend, Jack Moscadelli, who planted the thought that I should be a judge long before it ever occurred to me and who supported me overtly and covertly every step of the way. Looking back to where all this began in the Mississippi Delta town of Greenville, Mississippi, a place where Jim Crow ruled supreme far longer than it should have, a flood of emotions washes over me. I am incredulous still, I am humbled, and I am emboldened by the prospect of doing good and doing well in this new place. Incredulous because I never could have imagined getting here from the Mississippi Delta, a place where the spirit-crushing regime of racial oppression claims so many dreams, so many possibilities, and so many lives. But by grace, I am here. Humbled because even though my journey in the law has brought me to this place, I know that I owe a debt for passage that can never be repaid. The story of how I came to be here today cannot be explained by a resume that highlights the victories and ignores the defeats. I know in my heart that this day would not be possible without the sacrifice of countless men and women whose names have been lost to history. I am mindful today that we are still commemorating the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, a time in our history that was at once terrifying and hopeful. My hero, Fannie Lou Hamer, and others risk everything for just the possibility that a day like today could happen. So I acknowledge with all the humility I can muster that everything that I am and everything that I have done has been made possible by the sacrifice of others. I claim no personal victory, 
in the honor that has been bestowed upon me. To paraphrase prophetic words spoken at another time in another place, I have survived and thrived on this journey because I have been blessed to live in houses that I did not build, drink from wells that I did not hew, and eat from harvests that I did not plant. And emboldened because I know I am called to do well and to do good. And I believe in my capacity to do so in this new place. I live and breathe the lessons of my history, which have always been a source of strength and inspiration for me. I can never leave that behind, even as the newest justice of the Supreme Judicial Court. That history compels a vigilance against injustice. For me, it is a vigilance that informs my thoughts, words, and deeds. I accept that as judges, we are not we are servants, not masters of the law, but we are not slaves, consigned to silence. We can speak to what we see and what we hear in the world around us. So I am ready to join my new colleagues in this exciting next chapter. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.